Hi guys. Well, I'm trying to appreciate the irony of this, that it is 25 degrees colder today in Atlanta, Georgia, than it is Ithaca, New York. So, while I'm sitting here in this gas-sucking truck in the rain, it is a beautiful day at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Hopefully the rain drumming on my truck won't uh, drown us out, but it is now, where are we? Maybe Thursday, April 13th, 2023. So uh, I want to thank uh, Alert Tribes member Jeremy Jimenez for sending me this excellent article from this excellent website, resilience.com, originally published by the Thai E by this fellow named Andrew Nikaforic. I have had, I've read several articles by this environmental journalist, Andrew Nikaforic, and Andrew is joining the rising tide of mostly lefty journalists uh, weighing in, you know, sounding more and more like Fox News. Here is just the latest in the rising chorus of journalists talking about the rising chorus of renewable energy skeptics. Yes, they, the rising tide of uh, anybody with a brain looking at the bright green lies of this renewable energy revolution saving the planet uh, from fossil fuels. So anyway guys, I'm going to put the link to here and on here. This is a long involved story. Uh, you really need to sit down. If, if anybody at this point, I, I'm, I'm just drumming out any doubt that anybody has left, anybody with half a brain thinking that the answer to the fossil fuel uh, conundrum on this planet is switching from fossil fuels to the bright green lie of renewables. So I'm going to read the first and third parts and leave out the middle. Take it away, Andrew, and tell us about this. <clears throat> We're going to have to dramatically downsize the dream of a future in which we replace 150-year-old fossil fuel infrastructure with clean energy by 2050. That is the message of a number of recent important reports and books. They underscore a number of problems with renewables illusion, including the complexity of the task, the toxicity of rare earth mining, and the scarcity of critical minerals. These grounded realists, including the French journalist I'm going to make a guess here, Julum Pitron, and the Australian geologist Simon, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing M-I-C-H-A-U-X, I'm going to say Michal, all have three basic messages. There are dramatic limits to growth. So he's going to break down uh, these uh, limits to growth, the complexity of the task, the toxicity of the mining, and the scarcity of minerals above other things. And the world needs a better plan to avoid collapse other than replacing one unsustainable fossil fuel system with another he didn't put the word unsustainable for some reason, but implied with another intensive mining system powered by even more extreme energies. In other words, electrifying the Titanic will not melt the icebergs in its path. Yes. For largely ideological reasons, many Greens, and I love this word, transitionists, we have a new tranny 
on the uh, in the glossary transitionist have presented the transition to renewables as a smooth road with no potholes. In so doing, they have ignored much basic geology, energy physics, and even geopolitics. As a consequence, many imagine the construction of millions of batteries, windmills, solar panels, transmission lines, and associated technologies, but they downplay the required intensification of mining for copper, nickel, cobalt, and rare minerals you've probably never heard of, such as dysprosium and neodymium. And so I was just reading in the uh, mainstream media today, the Joe Biden administration cheering on. They just approved this giant transmission line ramming a, is it 700 mile long, one of these high powered transmission lines from all of these solar panel farms going this you know right across our public lands nowhere mentioning what these trans the, 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 how much copper is going into hundreds of miles and they're getting ready to okay another one uh, anybody who thinks copper high energy transmission lines are renewable anyway one of the great lies, one of the great lies of modern technological society is that of endless mineral abundance. Urban consumers who have little knowledge of energy realities underpinning their existence, can you say, I mean, over the planet, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of just the transmission lines connecting all of this green, clean energy. <clears throat> uh, urban consumers have swallowed the idea that their digital gadgets, can you say this computer, that digital gadgets and automation will somehow detach our society from the physical world and allow us to do more with less, leading to a dematerialization of society. But that is a wholesale fiction, a wholesale fiction long debunked by the likes of the energy ecologist Vaclav Smil, who I was just talking about a couple of days ago, and the late geologist Walter Youngquist. The average North American citizen not only consumes 1.3 million kilograms, I think a kilogram is 2.2 pounds, so what is that, 3 million pounds, the average North American citizen not only consumes 3 million pounds of minerals, metals, and fuel in their lifetime, but has no idea where they come from or at what cost. And so he is talking about one of the main brands of clueless morons. And this includes any little lefty who thinks that uh, the, the switch from fossil fuels to the wholesale lie, the wholesale fiction of all of this crap they're talking about uh, has no environmental cost. Uh, they are the, the most clueless morons of the clueless morons. Even, even listeners of Fox News understand okay, better than a lot of these little lefty, greeny environmentalists. Even a Fox News listener understands the lie of this. Uh, anyway, 
the current global mining footprint is already unsustainable. If that plastic word that I, if that plastic word has any meaning left, I would say uh, the word sustainable is more plastic than unsustainable. Uh, the word sustainable has no meaning left. Uh, the word unsustainable is everywhere I could turn the camera around. Uh, anyway, I think there's plenty of meaning left in the word unsustainable. Maybe he meant to say sustainable. Anyway, in his book, Extraction to Extinction, the British geologist David Howe politely notes that current mining operations <clears throat> have now become their own geological force scraping, sorting, and collecting more dirt, rock, and sediment than the world's rivers, wind, rain, and glaciers combined every year. But you cannot build solar panels, windmills, or electric cars without mining more copper, more lithium, more iron, and more al aluminum, along with the rare earth technology metals that only appear in small concentrations. That means vastly more destructive scraping and digging of ocean floors, rainforest, and tundras on a scale in conceivable to most environmentalists, meaning most of these little mainstream greeny environmentalists who have not gone doomer yet and understood this, the vast majority of these little greeny mainstream uh, environmentalists are still cheering on digging up the planet to save the planet, but more and more of these environmentalists uh, are pulling their heads out of their you-know-what and coming to the realize, realization that this is, is one big fat lie. Ain't gonna happen if it does happen. Game over for planet Earth quicker than fossil fuels will kill this planet. I am going to make the statement, the frying pan that we're in now versus the fire they're talking about jumping into, I will make the statement, I am seeing enough evidence that I am believing, uh, not that I'm a mainstream uh, environmentalist, I am believing this energy revolution is more of a threat to planet Earth than fossil fuels. I'm willing to stand up and make that statement. So do I, I guess I'm a shill. I am a shill for the fossil fuel industry. Yes. Okay, where were we? Back to Andrew. Already, already the industrial global machine that serves our shop till you drop culture has dug up more materials and metals than the globe's total living biomass. In other words, our machines, cell phones, buildings, cars, asphalt roads, concrete, plastic, gravel, and bricks started to outweigh the world's plants, fungi, animals, and bacteria uh, three years ago. If we continue on this extractive course, and all we're doing is ramping it up times 10, the pile of human mind materials on this groaning planet will triple global biomass by 2040, 17 years from now, triple the uh, global biomass on this planet. Will it really matter if we reach net zero emissions, and that's a whole nother big fat bright green lie, 
that we don't even get to in here, the myth of the net zero emissions, which ain't going to happen. Will it really matter if we reach net zero emissions by extinguishing the last remnants of biodiversity in the process, asked the U.S. physicist Tom Murphy in a recent essay, which I'm going to be reading here in the near future. Uh, Murphy considers the current prescription for stopping climate change with a mining boom to support an industrial production of renewable technologies a dangerous course. Quoting this essay, which I say I'm probably going to be reading in a couple of days, quoting Murphy, it's doubling down on the wrong thing propping up and accelerating the machine that is eating the planet alive. Barreling forward on renewable energy is the last thing Earth's critters would vote for and would be considered one of the more disruptive decisions we could make, close quote. I don't know why he's he didn't say most instead of more. Murphy is far from alone in that assessment. After the U.S. renewable skeptic Alice Friedemann, you can find my interview with Alice somewhere in my interview thing. After the U.S. renewable skeptic Alice Friedemann tabulated the mining costs of rare earth metals of rare earth mineral mining needed for renewables, including enormous tailing ponds, poisoned groundwater, radioactive waste, and volatile geopo geopolitics, Friedman flatly concluded, quote, our quest for a more ecological growth model has resulted in intensified mining of the Earth's crust to extract the core ingredient, rare metals, with an environmental impact that could prove far more severe than that of oil extraction, close quote. Years ago, the U.S. historian and technology critic Lewis Mumford argued that civilization's dependence on intense mining had dramatically changed its values as the extraction business became more important to empires. It contaminated economic thinking with an ethos dedicated to making a killing as opposed to a living. In mining, the ends always justifies the means, and in a technological society, everything is now mined, from soils to people's behavior on the internet. Back in 1934, 89 years ago, Mumford described what this destructive ethos entailed. Quote, the miner works not for love or for nourishment, but to make his pile. The classic curse of Midas became perhaps the dominant characteristic of the modern machine. Whatever it touched was turned to gold and iron, and the machine was permitted to exist only where gold and iron could serve as foundation, close quote. And now, of course, you would probably say instead of gold and iron, you would say copper and lithium, I guess. So, when you strip away all the plastic words and inflated claims, what you find in the enthusiasm for a new era of renewables is the prospect of making <clears throat> another pile. 
and Canada mining companies already are licking their chops with more than 50 rare earth mining projects now on the books. The Mining Association of Canada declares without a hint of irony that there is a natural synergy between mining and so-called clean technology, yet neither mining nor technology are, clean, are green or clean. In Australia, geologists now gush without embarrassment that, quote, we will need more mines to save the planet. But more mines will have the opposite effect. More destroyed landscapes, debased watersheds, and displaced rural communities, all to sustain our technological dependence on minerals. The average smartphone now contains at least 40 elements from the periodic table, including cobalt and six rare earth minerals that make the screen glow. The average electric car uses six times more critical minerals than a combustion car. An onshore wind plant needs nine times more mineral resources than an equivalent gas-fired power plant, an e-bike. An e-bike is more mineral intensive than an ordinary bike, and so on. Renewables just have not accelerated the demand for rare earth minerals, but a variety of base metals such as copper, silver, and of course cobalt. <clears throat> Every electric vehicle now contains about 75 kilograms, what's that, about 200 pounds of copper or three times more than a conventional vehicle. One single wind turbine generally contains 500 kilograms. That's about 1,400 pounds of nickel. That nickel requires 100 tons of steel making coal to be refined and every crystalline silicon solar panel contains 20 grams of silver paste. It takes 80 metric tons of silver to generate approximately one gigawatt of solar power. <clears throat> In power terms, that's equivalent to 9,000 Nissan Leafs. Demand is projected to spiral upwards. A recent UK report on minerals estimated, quote, global demand for electric vehicle battery minerals, lithium, graphite, cobalt, and nickel is projected to increase bet by between six and 13 times by 2040 in the next 17 years under stated policies which exceeds the rate at which new primary and secondary sources of the minerals are currently being developed, close quote. And again, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing M-I-C-H-A-U-X correctly. Simon Michaud is an Australian-born geologist who now works for Finland's Geological Society. Over the last couple of years, as I've reported on here, Michel has produced a number of comprehensive papers that challenge the assumption that there is enough energy and minerals to replace combustion engines with electric ones and fossil fuels with other forms of, quote, green power. He recently made an important calculation on what would be needed to replace a system run by fossil fuels with a renewable one based on 2019 consumption figures. 
the scale of the thing is mind-boggling. Just to replace 46,000 power stations run by oil, coal, gas, and nuclear energy would require the construction of 586,000 power stations run by wind, solar, and hydrogen. That is 10 times greater than the existing system due to the low power density of renewables. Building such infrastructure will require an incredible volume of metals and rare earth minerals and a vastly larger scale of mining. No wonder billionaires talk about mining asteroids, Mars, and the ocean floor. Since 400 BC, various civilizations have dug up 700 million tons of metals, everything from bronze to uranium, prior to 2020. So this is, he's going back to 400 BC, but a so-called green transition will require mining another 700 million metric tons by 2040 alone, uh, calculates Michelle. So you take everything that we have mined in the past 2,600 years, and we are supposed to do that again in the next 17 years, and then do it again in the next 17 to 20 years. Do you understand why uh, physicist Phil Garrett said, um, not Phil, uh, Tim Garrett says, ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna happen, guys. Cannot happen. Can't happen. This, this is, is a flat out biggest lie being rammed down your throat than anything you have ever heard in your life. This is pure, unadulterated, horse shit. This whole thing is horse shit. Whole thing. Ain't gonna happen. Uh, Copper tells the grim story here. Try running a phone or a windmill without this metal. Current copper reserves stand at 880 million tons. That is equal to approximately 30 years of production. But industry will need four and a half billion tons of copper to manufacture just one generation of renewable technologies, uh, he estimates. That is six times, six times the volume of copper mined throughout history. There you go. And in, uh, in the uh, next 30 years, we're going to rip out of this planet six times the volume of copper we have ever uh, dug up uh, in the past, however, uh, 5,000 years. And after that first generation comes many more generations and sooner than you might imagine. On average, a windmill and solar panel has to be replaced every 25 years, and that is why energy critic Nate Hagens has called them rebuildables instead of renewables. Global reserves for battery metals such as water-intensive lithium in Latin America and slave labor extracted cobalt in the Congo present even more problems. They represent less than 5%, less than 5% of what society needs for this energy transition. And so, as Michelle highlights in his research, society will need to develop different materials for batteries than lithium. Quote, the message here is that we need to come up with a different plan. Declining ore quality complicates this picture. 
the world's industrial machine has already exploited the easiest metal reserves to extract. As a result, the volume of rock processed for gold increased between 20 and 50 percent between 2000 and 2009, while production declined by 11 percent or did not change. Costs, meanwhile, climbed significantly. Diminishing returns halts the entire metal mining industry. Paying more for less comes with extreme energy cost as ore quality declines industry must use more energy to mine it. Recent studies show that the average ore grade of copper mines has decreased by about 25 percent in just the past 10 years. That means more fossil fuels must be burned to haul and crush more rock. As a result, total energy consumption in copper mining has increased at a higher rate than production. Growing energy intensity translates into higher emissions for lower returns. Multiply the problem of depleting ore quality for other essential metals for renewable energy, and you have a major global crisis in the making. Michaud estimates that the carbon footprint of the world's mining industry could soon surpass that of industrial agriculture. The goal of weaning the world off fossil fuels with renewables runs into another geological problem. Mining is not an app that you can download overnight. Of 1,000 potential deposits, only one or two become economic mines, and on average it takes 20 years, 10 to 20 years, to develop a workable deposit. Furthermore, increasingly volatile market conditions shut down two of every 10 operating mines. Extracting technology metals is also a high energy and high emissions affair. Even the International Energy Agency recently admitted in its mineral, re mineral report, quote, production of energy transition materials can lead to significant greenhouse gas emissions. These minerals typically require much more energy to produce per unit of product than other commodities, which results in higher emissions intensity." Close quote. In response to Michelle's work and the IEA report, a group of academics with no background in geology recently wrote a paper in the journal Joul claiming that people had nothing to worry about. Quote, historically, mineral markets have adjusted to accommodate growing demand over time. Close quote. The paper unfortunately pretends that depletion, corruption, wars, water shortages, and geopolitics do not exist in global mining markets. Moreover, it leaves out the minerals needed for batteries and only addresses one tenth of the demand needed for, you know, this great energy transition. And from there, the, the whole middle of this essay, he dives into breaking down all of this stuff about rare earth realities, which just for time's sake, but if you're unclear about the rare earths, this is like a whole nother rant. Uh, let's see. How was my... I'm gonna... Uh, guys, 
I'm just going to blast forward. You can go on the link and finish this or so. I'm going to blast forward here because I think this is a pretty important discussion. So, here is the basic problem as eloquently summed up by Michelle. Over 150 years, civilization has built a highly complicated industrial system based on cheap fossil fuels. The cheapness of those fuels created a robust banking system and an industrial agricultural system. If it fueled urbanization and globalization, Moreover, cheap energy sustained the illusion that resources are inexhaustible. Now that fossil fuel emissions have cooked the climate and decimated biological diversity, our fearless leaders want to replace that entire system with one that is more mineral intensive and complex. They want to do so at a moment when economic flows have slowed down to the, due to the rising cost of extreme fossil fuels such as fracked shale gas and mined bitumen. The whole process of replacing a declining system with a more complex mining-based enterprise is now supposed to take place with a fragile banking system, dysfunctional democracies, broken supply chains, cr critical mineral shortages, and hostile geopolitics. Meanwhile, climate events are destroying infrastructure and producing great waves of homeless migrants from failing states. All of these incontestable realities highlight the fact that our dreams of a renewable powered boom are illusory. We need a different conversation than fossil fueled business as usual or a Green New Deal. Michel has offered some starters, quote, we need frank discussion about what minerals we think we need versus what we have got, he said in an excellent interview with Nate Hagens on his podcast, The Great Simplification. And then we are going to realize that what we got won't work with the existing plan, close quote. Fund back to Andrew, fundamentally, we need to talk about a future of less instead of a future of more. Society will have to build simple products that last and that can be easily recycled, as Michel quote, and we will scale back our needs and our society will simplify, close quote. Winding up with Andrew, that is the conversation we should be having now, the one we continue to avoid. Anyway, amen, Brother Andrew Nikaforek, and who knows, if I ever start uh, interviewing people, we'll have to get Andrew on the show and uh, obviously Simon on the show. All right, perfect timing. <laughs> anyway, the, the vampire has returned and my battery is blinking. So I'm going to get back to Amazon.com buying me a solar-powered uh, power station while I still can. Oh, my gosh.